morning, Jesus Image Church. How you guys doing this morning? Welcome all those that are watching online. And this morning, I just, uh, I woke up and I heard his love endures forever. So I just want us to lean in this morning, knowing that his love for you endures forever. Psalms 34 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. And that's what we're going to do this morning. It says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. And no shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm going to say that again. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Father. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for coming, Lord. We thank you for being in our midst. Your love is eternal. We ask you this morning, Father, give us eyes to see Jesus rightly. Open the eyes of our hearts. Come on, I want you to say that. Say, open the eyes of my heart this morning. Let me see Jesus rightly, that I may love him rightly. Rightly do they love you, the scriptures say. Lord, we sing praises to your name, Jesus. Come on, can you begin to lift your praise to Jesus? We love you, King of glory. You're welcome in this place.
Why don't we all just lift our hands in this place? Lord, we're here. Jesus, we are here. We're here for you, Lord. We are here for you. No other agenda except for you. I pray you are loved this morning. That you're adored this morning. pray that we move your heart. I pray that there's a leap within you from us. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. There is none like you. There is none like you. You are truly set apart. You're above all. I pray the supremacy of Christ is ruling and reigning in this place this morning, in this house, in this church. Above every doubt, above every fear, every worry, every anxious thought, any restlessness within us, I pray that you are above all of it. You're above every addiction. You're above every wayward thought. You're above every sickness, every disease, every wayward child. You are above it all. And we give it to you this morning in your precious, beautiful name. Let's seal it with praise, church. Let's just thank Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, praise you, and love you. We give you everything this morning. Jesus mighty name. Amen. Amen. You guys can make your way back to your seats. And as you guys do, why don't we thank our our worship team, our, our choir this morning. Thank you guys so much. thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness that leads men into repentance. Your true kindness, the tender hand of the Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your gospel that truly does set free. That makes all things new and brings us in right relationship with you. We thank you, Jesus. I pray for softened hearts in this room by the Holy Spirit, pliable, ready to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He's so good, so faithful. I felt this morning when I woke up, when I was praying, I, I felt the Lord say, some of you guys don't, in this room don't really grasp the true revelation of it is finished and it is done, especially in your own life. You know, my, I was driving yesterday to pick up my wife from the airport with my daughter, Briella, and she was in the back seat. And we had a, one of the Christian radio stations on in the background. And somebody on, one of the pastors on there said, he was talking about how God forgets, forgives our sins and then forgets it. And Briella said, Daddy, is that true that God really, really forgets our sins? And I said, absolutely, baby. She goes, how is that true? And I said, the God of all knowing chooses to forget. And I said, he's God. He could do whatever he wants. But secondly, I said, when we say yes to him, baby, and we ask for forgiveness, I says he sees us through his son. That this is the lens in which he chooses us to see us. It's through his son. But most of us in the room, after we have said yes to Jesus, that we don't see ourselves through his son. That we actually still, still see every mistake we've ever made. And or maybe those around us still see the mistakes that we have made, and they hold it against you. But one thing that God 
never does is leverage your, your past against you. That he actually chooses to forget in the moment that we say yes to him. And that all things do become new. That we do go from being blind to seeing, to being dead, to being alive in him. That there's actually a true crossing over of being bound to free. But some of us don't believe it in this room when we leave this room. And that's why there's still these things that hold on to us. And it just doesn't have to be drugs and alcohol. It could be frustration and anger. I've needed the Lord, man, over these past eight years, nine years that I've been following Jesus. I needed him many times. And I've had to turn back to the cross, turn back to the blood of Jesus and understand what he truly did when I said yes to him. See, we don't go from being bound in the world to being bound in, in Christianity, but there's a lot of us in this room that do. You may be free from drugs, but then you're addicted to religion or you're bound to fear and frustration, striving. There's a true rest in Christ that he paid for, that we are to enter into. There's a true rest and a satisfaction in the believer that we can actually live and walk and move and have our being in. But we try to add to the cross. We try to add our striving and our good works after we say yes to him. And that's not what he's called us to do and be. In fact, in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 3, uh, verse 3, it says, You who begun in the spirit, a conception in the spirit, are now trying to be made perfected in the flesh. Another translation says, in human efforts. Meaning we say yes to Jesus and then we know that we're born from above, the Bible says, not born of this earth, that we're born of the incorruptible seed, not the corruptible seed. And there's new life in us and you realize all things have passed away. And then we go on and then we try to add to that. And then we try to perfect ourselves after that. The Bible says that the ministry of condemnation, although it was glorious, the ministry, the law, he said, but now there's a ministry of righteousness that has been given to us and it is a gift from God. But that gift from God doesn't leave us after the moment we say yes to him. The gift of righteousness is what we, we could not obtain ourselves. We couldn't make ourselves right. But he has given us this gift. But he doesn't want you guys to live in shame and condemnation in this Christian life. Some of us live in more condemnation and shame, shame being saved than when we did in the world. Because then we didn't even care. And all of a sudden we get into Christianity and now we're worried and fearful and guilty and ashamed. When he died so you could truly be free in your mind. You can actually have true rest, not restlessness within you. Not the anxieties of, man, am I going to make it? Does he love me? Listen, he loves you as much as he does now as when you, when you did when you were born or when you're in the middle of your mess. You can't earn his love. Christ paid it all. It is finished and it is done. This, this is good news. It's amazing news that we did nothing to earn it, but he gave it to us. We could be addicted, bound and hurting and crying out in one moment saying yes to him in repentance. He gives us himself. He gives us him. And this is our new life. It's in him that we live, move, and have our being. Man, I've thought about that. I've thought about Jesus Christ, God, becoming a seed in a woman, living a perfect life, actually feeling pain, true pain, true torment that God did, actually feeling it, being ripped apart, blood pouring out of his body. 33 years within time, and then to think about all we do, this is what we have to do, is yes to him by faith. That's what the Bible says, that by faith we are saved. And then in Galatians chapter 2, it says this faith working through love, that's it. That's the Christian life, is that we say yes and believe what he has done, and then we just live in love relationship with him and him and us. And I promise you, that's where freedom is found. Where freedom isn't found is when we say yes to him and then we go home and then we try to do it. We try not to sin. We try not to make a mistake. We try not to, all right, I'm going to look here. I'm not going to do this. I've tried to do that. And that just leaves me back doing the same thing that I used to do. But what doesn't is knowing that, oh, the gospel is alive in me. The blood of Jesus did take away every single stain and sin of yesterday. That I truly am a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then a year from now, that's still alive in me. It's still real within me that he paid the price for everything so that I could be completely free. 
But I just pray that striving leaves in this room. Restlessness leaves in this room. Trying to earn your salvation leaves in this room. And you just give yourself to him, knowing that he paid for it all, that it is finished and it is done. If you guys could just close your eyes briefly. If there's anybody in here that, even if you've made an altar call before because you you made a mistake rather than giving yourself to him in love. Or maybe you've lost the joy of his salvation. You're just not happy that you're bound to worry, chained to fear, chained to anxiety. Or maybe you don't know him. You need to fully, truly surrender your life this morning to him. But if you need Jesus and you're in the room and you say, yeah, that's me. I just would love for you just to lift your hand up briefly and say, that's me. Thank you, Lord, for those hands. Thank you, Jesus, for those hands. Thank you, Lord, for all of those hands. If we could have everybody just stand in the room. And you raised your hand. Or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you feel that beautiful conviction of the Lord. Listen, convicts you, causes you to run to Christ. Shame will keep you in your seat. If you feel so afraid that you can't say yes and run to him, it's not from the Lord because his love always brings you close. And so if you lifted your hand, I just want you to make your way down out of the aisles and right up here to the front. And we're just gonna pray with you guys and we're gonna believe that what you just said yes to is gonna be true to you, alive in you, and it's never gonna leave you. Amen, let's just thank Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, if you're in the, if you're in the room, you, you could feel it. You feel like, man, I need to say yes to him. I want to be free. That the, that the thought of yesterday is going to be forever removed. That yesterday's mistakes will truly be thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. that you'll actually feel new life in you. And those words, it is finished, will be true to you. A true revelation of the cross. It is finished, son. It is done. It is finished, daughter. It is done. Now rest in me. Rest in me. We're just going to say this together as a family. Everybody in the room. And and as we say these words, these words are always directed and pointed at the Lord. As you're repeating these words, I want you guys to see the cross and what he's done. Let's say, Jesus, we thank you for everything, for your life. Father, forgive me of everything I have done. Thank you, Jesus, for remembering my sin no more. Thank you, Jesus, for throwing it into the sea of forgetfulness. For I am washed clean by the blood of Jesus. I believe you were begotten of the Father. Jesus, I believe that you lived a perfect life here on earth. Jesus, I believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. And I thank you, Jesus, that you're enthroned at the right hand of the Father. And one day you're coming back for me. Jesus, we thank you that you're alive and I'm alive in you. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my past my present, and my future. I give you everything this morning. I give you the entirety of my life. I deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you seal it.
Holy Spirit, I pray you seal every salvation in this room this morning. Seal every salvation by the Spirit that they were truly born from above. That repentance is a lifestyle. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Quickly, um, there's a little pamphlet that you guys all got. And if you guys haven't been here before, in that pamphlet, there's um, six things that, that we encourage you guys every single day to follow. And it's following Jesus. And what following Jesus looks like, it Love looks like something. And we actually have a uh, Sunday school that we do every Sunday morning that actually follows these six steps. So if you guys want to attend those, you guys can. They start, I believe, at 845 on Sunday morning. And our ushers can direct you on where to go about that. But number one that we have in there is that that we get into the Word of God. This is life to us. This is real to us. This is true bread. You know, the Bible says that that it, it is alive and sharp. It is alive and active. Like this is a living, living word in it. And I pray that you guys fall in love with the scriptures, that you guys actually fall in love with the reading the word of God. It was hard for me to read anything growing up. I'm just being honest with you. But this book, the author sits with us, and he helps us read it. He's living inside of you guys now, which is amazing. And number two is that, that we get to go pray every single day and just love Jesus. You guys have full access to him by the blood of Jesus. The Bible says you could come before him uh, holy and blameless without a single fault. And actually believe that while you're walking in to be with him, that you are holy and blameless before him without a single fault. Because we enter in through the blood, not in our own merit. And number three is that you guys get connected to a church, to a body of believers um, that love him, that love Jesus, that make him the Make them all, not even the center, like Pastor Mike said, but all. And everything that you guys do, and that they, they believe the full breath of the Word of God, and they are led by the Spirit. And if you guys don't attend a church here locally, you guys can come to this one. And number four is that um, you guys get baptized in water. And this baptism of water actually um, cleanses you, cleanses the mind. The Bible says, not of the body of, of dirt, but of the mind a seared conscience, a mind that is, that is seared by the world, by, by, the, by, the, by the old man, that, that when you go into the, the waters of baptism and you, you partake in his death, burial, and resurrection, that you come out with the, the newness of mind. I believe the mind of Christ. And that some people are truly encounter the Lord in the waters because they, they, they signify him, the spirit of God. And number five is that we... Uh, we are baptized into his spirit, which we're going to pray for you guys in a moment, that true power from on high comes when we ask of him. The Bible says actually that he is the baptizer. He is the one that baptizes us into himself. And I pray that you guys, at the end of the day, what it is, it's an encounter with God. That's what it is. And in this encounter, that you guys become a witness in true authority and in true power. And we're going to pray that for you guys in a moment. And I just pray that you, you just see him. That he just encountered, it's for everybody in here, that we can all be baptized over and over and over again. We could be filled with the spirit of God. And then the last thing is that you guys become a witness to him, that you guys share the gospel, share your faith, share the testimony of Jesus, share what he's done this morning, share what he's going to continue to do in your guys' life throughout your Christian walk. And as you share a testimony, you're reminding the Lord of what he's done every time. It's just beautiful. He knows that it's still alive inside of you as you share it. That it's still real to you every single day. And so let's just stretch our hands towards everybody up here. And let's ask the Lord to touch us as well quickly. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, you are the baptizer. You are the one that clothes us with yourself. The one that baptizes us into you, Jesus. I pray for an encounter with you even now, Lord, as we pray. I pray for for true power to come from on high, God, that they will see signs, wonders, and miracles flow in and through their lives, every single one up here. Father, I thank you, Jesus, that the gospel will go forth through their lives. They will be proclamations, they will proclamate the gospel, that it'll be real and alive to them, Jesus. I pray authority in their words, clarity in their speech, wisdom as they speak. Father, I, make, I thank you that you make him a witness unto the ends of the earth. 
Father, we thank you. I pray, and above all, that your love is shed abroad in each and one of their hearts. Your true love by the Holy Spirit. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Why don't we thank Jesus? Let's just thank the Lord as, as they make their way back to their seats as well. Really thank the Lord. Jesus, we thank you for every single salvation. It never leaves them. It never leaves them in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys could go back to your seats. Why don't we welcome Amy as she comes up here? Let's thank the Lord. Let's really thank the Lord for newness of life. Let, let us never be tired of thanking the Lord for salvations. We were always once there. We were once there. And as we step into offering this morning, I'm going to read from Proverbs 3. It says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. As the promise of keeping his commandments, long life and peace. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. I'm going to jump down to verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. See, we have to keep all commands of the Lord. And we keep them not for the promise of what they bring, but we keep them because we love him, right? We love him. We want to honor him, not just in our words, but in our actions and our deeds. And so honoring him with our worship, honoring with just as we were sitting here, giving our yes and amen to the lives that were here in our, in our witness it's all of the things. And so this morning we can come and we can bring him an offering because he's worthy, because he asks for it. And it's truly a joy to bring what is his, what's given to us by him back to him. And so we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord that we wouldn't just love him with our worship, with our witness, with our yes. We would love him with everything that we have. And if we've, if we've been withholding out of fear, that this morning fear would leave. All fear would leave. The perfect peace of God would come. And that our heart would be opened to giving. And so Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to give into your hands this morning. Lord, you've given everything. You've given us your son. And so we look at you. We look at the cross. We look at the precious blood that was shed. And God, we do honor you. We honor you not just in our word, but we honor you with our lives. Lord, bless everyone that gives this morning. Bless them. Bless them. Remove any fear. Remove any fear in this moment. Let us come in childlike faith, knowing that you are a good father, and you will willingly provide for every need. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're in the room, if you need an envelope, you can lift your hands. Our ushers will be around to give. You can text the number on the screen. If you're watching online, you can text the number that's on your screen as well. Just really quick before we rush the buckets, we also do want to invite you after service. If you're new to the church, if you've been coming for a few months, we have a Connect class today immediately after service. You can bring your kids. We'll have light refreshments. We just want to connect with you if you want to hear the vision of the church. If you're looking for more ways to get involved, to serve, to be a part of our outreach, our team will be there to answer questions for you. So we would love to have you after service. But yes, you guys are welcome to rush the buckets. If you're watching online, we will be right back.
There's only one name that is worthy. There's only one king on the throne. He is the light of our salvation. All praise belongs to him alone. And there's only one way to the Father. Jesus, one heart that melts a heart of stone.
back from our first week of the Jesus Tour in California. And soon we will show you, I don't know how many of you watched, but the Lord did such an amazing and just beautiful things. Um, But we have some members of our team because the Lord didn't just do things in service, but also on the ground while we were in California. So we'd love for them to share some of those testimonies. So Tasia, I'd love for you to share what the Lord did. Hi, yes. um, I just, as soon as we landed, I just really felt the Lord's passionate love for the people of California. And we, like, literally, we got off the plane, and then we got on a shuttle bus to go get our rental cars. And, like, as soon as I got on the shuttle bus, I sat across from a guy who the Lord said him. And I was like, okay. And so I was just, just, like, looking at him and just waiting for the Lord to, like, say something. He said, no, speak to him of how much I love him. And so I just started asking him about his life, and I was like, the Lord just really just showed me his love for you and just how much he loves you. And I was like, do you know the Lord? Do you know Jesus? And he said, no. And I would just explain the gospel to him and how he came and died for his life. And then um, I asked him, I was like, do you want to accept him? And he said, yes. And like every word that I said and that like the Lord was like giving to share, like his eyes were so glued to everything that I was saying. And just, and then when he gave his life to the Lord, I was like, all right, now the Lord wants to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, okay. And so he like closed his eyes and like, I like asked him to repeat after me. And then Kimberly was with me, Kimberly and Crystal. And she said, what do you feel? And he said, I feel heat all over my body. And he was like, I don't, and it was just like, he was just so excited. And like, he looked like he had a light in him. It was just like his whole demeanor changed. He was lit up and excited. And then I asked him where he was coming from. He said, Atlanta. He said, I'm visiting my cousin from, um, I'm visiting my cousin for a couple of days and I'm going back to Atlanta. And I like told him about Brian Guerin's church in Ascend and just said, you need to get plugged into a church, go to a church of the body that believes the Bible from front to back. And like that has the Holy Spirit, believes in the Holy Spirit. And I told him about Brian Guerin's church and he was like, okay, like he just was so glued. And it just was so easy. It was like the Lord pre- went, prepared the way and went before us and was like drawing his people. And it just was so easy to just even share the love of Jesus. And so I was just excited to just be a part of that. Yeah, um, like Teja said, just to even be in the room was just such an honor. And um the first day we got there, um, or the first morning, I should say, while I was just pressing in and really asking the Lord, like, Lord, like, what is on your heart? Like, what is on your heart for this, for this region, for this state? Um, the Lord just showed me a picture, and I got a picture of actually Brownsville Revival. And I had this, um, just the picture of when Steve Hill would just preach the gospel and hundreds of people would run to the front. And I just started contending that people would run, would run. They wouldn't hesitate, but that they would run. And so every morning I just kept praying, Lord, that the people would run to you, not hesitate, not get up and think about it, but that they wouldn't even, they would just, their body would quicken and they would run to, run to the altar. And so Um, I think it was before, on our way to San Diego, which was the last stop, uh, my car went to the grocery store to get some snacks because it was going to be a late night. And there was a lady there who she said she just saw our shirt that said Jesus Tour, and she stopped us. She was like, what is this? What's this tour that you're doing? And so we shared with her. Um, and she was like, we need it. San Diego's hungry. And she's like, we need this. She's like, I know it may not seem like that, but we really, really need this in our region. And then that night, um, as Pastor Michael was preaching the gospel, I was just contending. And as I looked up, I saw like hundreds of people running. Like it wasn't even like a hesitation. They were running to the altar and it was flooded. It was kind of wild because we felt like the room felt like this house. It just felt the same. And the altar was packed. Like people were in the aisles. We had to like make room for people. And I just was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that this region is hungry. And then 
we got to be a part of something that's so much bigger than us. Like this goes beyond us. Like we got to be a part of what men and women have plowed the ground. And I'm just, I'm so, so honored. And I just want to share with you guys, like this is what we got to be a part of as a church. Like what we have been contending for and praying for those lives. And then the testimonies. I don't know if you guys watched, but there were like this one girl, her eyes, I'm sure we'll have a video, but just the, the, um, the testimonies of people getting healed, it was just the most incredible thing to be a part of. And so, yeah, the Lord was, he was in the region. It was good. Amen. Yes, let's celebrate. Let's give the Lord praise. That's exciting. Well, we'd love to uh, direct your attention to our screens and welcome Pastor Michael. He'll be joining us via Zoom this morning. And there he is. Hey, good morning, everyone. Love you guys so much. And, uh, uh, Gosh, can you just give the Lord praise? Yolan, I want to make sure I can hear him. It just gets me going. And <laughs> the Lord likes it. More importantly, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all you've done. Yeah, Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, Lord. And we ask you to speak to us. We celebrate all you're doing, all you did this past weekend, or this past week, I should say. And we thank you now, Lord, wonderful Holy Spirit, that you will come and touch your people, that you would feed us today. Thank you for every soul saved and every body healed. What an honor it is to worship you and to be invited into your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we thank the Lord just sacrificially one more time? Make sure I can hear him, guys. Thank you, Jesus. Well, there's a, I, d- I would like to just, uh, I'd like our team to cue the, uh, just the recap video of uh, our first leg of the Jesus tour. I'm still in California. I missed my flight yesterday. I was, I woke up not feeling so great and had preached until late the night prior. And we had to drive about an hour and a half back to where we were staying. And uh, we had a morning flight and woke up really feeling not so great. So uh, and then I, we had we flown home today, uh, I would not have been able to do this. I would have been in the air. So we, we had to stay here today. And um, I'm actually preaching to you now from Southern California. And I know the Lord uh, is going to move powerfully. But I'd like to show you guys that recap video. So guys, can we can we go ahead and run that? And I'd love to hear it as well of an eternal stain remover more powerful than the stain of any sin more powerful than drug addiction perversion hatred unforgiveness adultery idolatry materialism lust of the flesh anger pride i know of a stain remover it's the blood that flows from emmanuel's veins it's the blood of the lamb The blood of the last Adam, not just the second Adam, the perfect man. The blood of the Son of the living God, the blood of the man from Galilee. The blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth will wash your sin away tonight. And it wouldn't move. It's been severe pain, and now I can bend it. uh, I have no pain. This one has been hurting so bad, the arthritis, for, for three years. Now it's gone. I started feeling like electricity just going through my whole entire body. My hands were red and swollen when you prayed for me, and they're not red or swollen. The pain's gone. Gradually, the pain went and went, and now it's all gone. It's all gone. And I don't have the burning sensation anymore. It hurt to go up and down the stairs, but now it doesn't. Yeah, let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. How wonderful. Well, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm so thankful to the Lord. We, we definitely have seen an incredible harvest and a great response out here uh, in Southern California. And this is a, a church family event. So to all of you in the room this morning and all of you who are tuning in online, um, you play a major, major part in this. This is a harvest that you're connected to and you're going to be connected to it in eternity. What an honor that is. I'm so humbled to see how the Lord is using uh, his ministry to impact the nations of the world. And we're getting to see that firsthand. We had to shut registration down early in all of these venues and they were not small venues. They're quite large uh, for uh, California standards and um, people came from all over. So I'm so grateful. And um, I want to thank our team, by the way, uh, we have the most incredible, uh, humble, uh, qualified team. They are just incredible. And I just love you guys so much. Really, thank you, thank you. I, I pinch myself when I think of the Lord uh, entrusting us to all walk together. God has given us an incredible team, and I love you all. And just want to thank you so much for your hearts. They flew yesterday, got delayed out over the Gulf of Mexico, I think, for close to an hour. I don't know. And, because of this this morning. Our worship team, I love you so much. Thank you for for what you pour out. I Hopefully the church is clapping right now. If not, I'll come home next week and rebuke them all. But we honor you. We love you. I thank you for ministering again this morning and um, how the Lord used you uh, uh, in Southern Cal has been beautiful. So, We'll be back in Southern Cal in July. And so if you're watching from Southern California and then again in August and then again in uh, ooh, yeah, September, is that right, Carla? If I'm wrong, forgive me. And then again in October, where we end in the north part, northern part of California, Sacramento and Redding. So if you're in LA, if you're in Pasadena, if you're in Orange County, again, we're coming back out. We're actually going to be using... Pastor Jensen Franklin's church in Orange County at Free Chapel will be back. Um, uh, if you're in any of those regions, Sacramento, Redding, LA, Pasadena, Orange County, maybe missing one or two, uh, come, come and come hungry because the Lord is, he's after our nation and the West Coast is burning. And so is Orlando. Orlando is burning as well in Jesus' name, huh? Hopefully you're clapping. All right. I think you're clapping, knowing you. Actually kind of had a, a little bet in my mind. How far would Amy Gray get in the testimony before she cried? And um, she, I was actually 30 seconds off on my timer. Uh, <laughs> don't ever change, Amy, if that ever dries up. We're sending you out. Um, all right, I want to talk to you today about the blood of Jesus. I preached on the blood of Jesus a few nights back, um, actually in San Diego. I'm not going to preach the exact same message, uh, but I felt something hit the room. I mean, the miracles were beautiful. Uh, those two ladies showing us their hands, uh, we'll get you a more detailed video, but they weren't, their hands weren't in pain. They were unable to use one or two of their fingers due to paralysis. One lady had cancer in her hand and uh, they cut the cancer out and due to the surgery, uh, she was unable to use one of her fingers. It was frozen straight. She watches us, she said weekly. She actually, I actually had Amy Gray holding the microphone, taking the testimony. And, uh, and uh, she goes, I watch you every week. She goes, I love your preaching. She looked at Amy and said, and I love your dancing. It was like she was part of the family. 
But the Lord loosed her hand, loosed her finger there. And then another lady, uh, that the next lady, uh, they were missionaries to Asia. Same thing. She could not bend her finger. God loosed her, loosed that finger. And then the lady who said she felt electricity, the reason she said the, the, the redness and the swelling went down wasn't you know, because of a minor issue. She had rheumatoid arthritis, which is a significant, horrible disease. I have friends who've been dealing with that for years. And um, right there in her seat, the redness and swelling went down completely, returned back to normal. She was able to move her hands again for the first time. She felt the power of God going to, I should say, move them that way without pain for the first time in a long time. Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. So that that is just incredible. There were so many. So, another lady's uh, uh, eyes were healed. She'd been seeing double at all times her entire life. I think she said she was 29, 26. I don't know. 26, Carla's age. Um, somewhere in there. But... Uh, she, for the first time in her entire life, uh, could look in certain directions and not see double. She saw regular in a, in, a, in a regular manner. So this is just beautiful. We're so thankful. But that last night I did preach on the blood in San Diego, and uh, the response was powerful. As Amy said, so many were born again. And we need a revelation on the blood. I... I think we've all been hearing what's been trembling regarding Holy Communion. I, I would echo that regarding a return in the body of Christ to the power of Holy Communion, which is why we receive communion weekly uh, in our church. And it's really impossible to understand the power of communion without a, a revelation of the blood of Jesus. And so I want to begin uh, with the blood of Jesus. And most of you I'm sure I've noticed by now that when we receive communion as a church family, people are healed. And this has been happening since. Wonderful Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Teach us and show us the power of the of the blood of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that as I begin ministering, that that anointing for healing that that would spill over this morning and that you would begin healing people even as I minister your word. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name that, that as the people come forward at the end of service, that the sick would be healed as they receive communion and that the brokenhearted would find healing, that the bound in their mind would be free in Jesus' name that those who are struggling with sin would find the grace, the power of the Spirit, the very energy of God, the energy of the Spirit, as the old saints used to say, that you would loose them from all that holds them and show them your beauty. This we ask in the mighty, glorious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord praise one more time and make sure I can hear it? Build my faith. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Take your Bibles uh, to Genesis 2, 17. I'm going to begin where I began the other night, San Diego. And then we're going to kind of go in a different direction. But Genesis 2, 17 says, But the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely 
die. I want you to highlight two words there, day and die. Now I want you to turn to Ezekiel 18, verse 4. I'd like you all to take notes. If you're doing it on a device, um, don't be like uh, Amy Pazinski and be scrolling on social while I'm teaching. <laughs> Watching Saved by the Bell videos. Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine, the soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. Here we see the Lord saying, I am the Lord of souls. That doesn't mean that every soul has yielded to the Lord. What this, what, this, what this is saying contextually is that the Lord reserves the right to say what happens to a soul if the soul sins. The Lord and the Lord alone reserves that right. Okay, that's very important because the moment man steps in and begins to determine the narrative as to what sin is, what it isn't, and the penalty, we have a big problem. That's happening today. Uh, rather than just taking the scriptures at face value, we create our own theologies that are not rooted in the Bible, that are not justified and rooted in the history of the church, and they typically are meant to serve our choices and our rebellion. And you see that happen. You'll often see sin in a certain group and uh, they they have grown up knowing something was sinful uh, and the only way to deal it really doesn't deal with it the only way to cope with the broken conscience is to create your own biblical reality that isn't biblical uh, really to create your own theology that isn't based on a true theology, because all theology is crossology, uh, which is the denial of self and looking at Christ crucified. So when we begin to determine what sin is and what it isn't, and then what happens to the one who sins, then we actually become not only our own theologian, but our own king and judge. It's a very prideful perspective. So here the Lord said, hey, look, I'm the one who determines this. And by the way, at the end of verse 4, he says, the soul who sins shall die. Okay? This is very important because uh, sin is a bigger deal than we like to think. Now, the origin of the gospel is not man's sin. Okay, that's, I should say, that's not the fountain. That's not the fountain of Christ crucified. The fountain of Christ crucified is the love of God. Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world or the casting down of the world, the text would say uh, in the original language, the casting down, the, before the throwing down, the, the, the foundation of the world, uh, Christ was crucified in the heart of God. So when we think of the gospel, we immediately begin with Christ crucified. That is the only picture of the love of God. Uh, sin is not the fountainhead of the gospel. Now, the gospel has dealt with sin beautifully and perfectly. I want to say that. So sin is a bigger issue than we like to think. And here, clearly in Genesis 2, 17, and in Ezekiel 18, 4, the Lord says, in the day you eat of the fruit, you will die. And then in Ezekiel 18, 4, he says, the soul who sins shall die. That's a, that's a problem. Okay, that's a big problem. Now, many say, would say that's Old Testament. 
Okay, turn in your Bibles to John 8, 24. Okay. I think we'd all agree that John 8 is the New Testament. That being said, let's read. Therefore, I said to you, this is Jesus speaking, that you will die, die in your sins. So sin is like the quicksand of death. It leads you into a deeper hole called death. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So here we see the origin of sin is actually revealed in this verse as well. The origin of sin is not believing that Jesus is who he says he is. Now notice, notice how he terms this. If you do not believe that I am he. So he's pointing to himself as Jehovah, as Adonai, as the God of the burning bush, where he says, I am that I am. And he's saying that is the origin, not believing that. Now, belief does not mean to mentally agree with something. That's where we get all screwed up. In the West, it means, oh, yeah. I, th I think that, yeah, I, I, I would mentally agree with that. But that is not what a biblical belief looks like. The word belief looks more like throwing your life upon, casting your life upon, trusting all that you are upon and in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Notice he connects this belief to his name, that he, that I am, he says, he. So it's a belief in the character and identity of Jesus that, that uh, brings me to the only rightful response, which is to throw my life upon him, to see his majesty and say, he is the Lord. And so that's what belief looks like. Not, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, I, I, I believe these tenets, um, I, I, I believe I can quote this confession. Confession is important, but salvation begins in the heart and then manifests through our declaration and then transforms our mind. So it's very important that we understand that Jesus connects a few things here. Number one, death and sin. Then he reveals the origin. You don't cast your life upon me because you don't know that I am. And if you know that I am, the only rightful response is biblical belief, the thrusting of one's life upon it. So we have a problem here. Sin brings death. Okay? And the Lord came to deal with death. Now, what is death? Separation from God. Now, when the Lord says this to Adam in Genesis 2, the day you eat of it, you shall die. I mentioned this in the school and on a Sunday morning. Did Adam just drop dead physically when he ate the fruit, when Eve gave him the fruit? No, he didn't die physically, but he died. Eve died that day. And, and, and that is culture today. People are walking around with bodies that exist, but they are dead. They're dead inside. Notice it's the soul that sins, it shall die. So they die they are dead inside, walking around, waiting on the body to finally breathe its last. So Adam did die that day. Eventually, his body caught up hundreds of years later. Okay. The Lord, remember, Jesus created Adam. We, we, we don't think that, that he did for some reason. We, we, for some reason, when we look at the Old Testament, which, by the way, the early church just called the Old Testament the Scriptures. I think we've done a disservice to the Bible by devaluing what we call the Old Testament. It is the word of God, the living word of God. We can call it that. I believe in the Old Testament. But Paul just called them the scriptures. The early church just called them the scriptures. They, I mean, wondering if they valued them is, it's a, it's a crazy thought. Of course they valued them. It's the only Bible they had. So when Paul taught Christ from the scriptures in the synagogue, he is teaching what we call the Old Testament. We have to realize that and be reintroduced to the beauty of this. So we have to remember, 
The Father, the Son, and the Spirit were involved in creating Adam. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are involved in releasing the breath of life into Adam so he becomes a living being. The church has always believed that, that, that the Son was present as well, for instance, in the Exodus. Paul even says that, that Christ was that rock and that he was in that cloud. Uh, that, that the Israelites followed. And that's why in John chapter 1, John writes, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Greek word dwelt there is tabernacled or tented. He tented among us. So that was John the disciples, the apostles way of saying, hey, hey, he's the one. He's the real tabernacle. He's pointing Israel back to their journey through the wilderness. So we have to remember this, that the Lord was involved in creating Adam, the Lord Jesus. And now there he is at the Father, Son, and the Spirit are inv were involved and always are involved in all that Godhead accomplishes. And so now the Lord's at a casket and his heart is broken because he's the Lord of life. And he knows that this is not uh, his desire for mankind to see their bodies go into the ground and decay and be corrupt. And so he weeps. And so how does the Lord deal with this? How does the Lord deal with this death sentence? And it is, sin is a death sentence, according to the Bible. Take your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. Make sure you stay still while I'm teaching. I have an overhead camera I'm looking through. I can see all of you. Just like those little ring cameras on people's front doors. Let me hear them, y'all, and I want to hear what they're doing right now. Okay, good. I hear you. I see all of you. See Luke's top knot? It's pointing west today, Luke. Revival's coming from the west. Push it east. No. <laughs> All right, Exodus 12, verses 12 through 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. So here we see the Lord declaring war against the gods of Egypt. He's about to judge. Now, these are not real gods. People get this so screwed up, and they begin to use this text to preach polytheism or many gods. No, there's one god. These are d demons. And to the Egyptians, they are God. They're, notice they're lowercase g here. And God is about to mock them and destroy them. And then here he says, I am the Lord. So the Lord is executing judgment upon Egypt. That speaks of sin. We have to remember the Lord still judges sin. Today, he still judges sin. You look no further than the book of Revelation. He's is I will take that woman Jezebel, throw her upon her, her sick bed. If she does not repent, she will die. Ananias and Sapphira, die. The sorcerer, stricken with blindness. That is all New Testament I just gave you. Though God is still holy, he is still a judge. The world is still Egypt. Just because we're on this side of Calvary, it does not mean that those who reject the Lord Jesus come under the fountainhead of grace and get to experience the riches of Christ. In fact, communion itself is only for the children of the Lord. And that's why Paul says, if you don't rightly discern it, or if you take it improperly, you can become sick and die. So here the Lord is after Egypt. He's going to judge Egypt. And that's happening for a few reasons. One, because they're, yeah, the Lord sends 10 plagues to deal with these some theologians would, would identify these 10 Egyptian gods, and the Lord's going to deal with each god with a plague. Okay? It's very possible. 
But additionally, Egypt will not let go of God's children, specifically the children of Israel. And God calls the children of Israel his firstborn. And so here in Exodus 12, the Lord is about to tell his children that he is going to deal with Egypt's firstborn. And this is why, because Egypt would not release God's firstborn. So God's saying, okay, here's the deal. You won't release my firstborn to me, my chosen people. I'm going to take your firstborn. That's a big deal. So remember, whatever you hold on to, whatever you keep back from the Lord, whether it's your finances, you, you know, specifically our tithe that belongs to the Lord and the offering, um, your life. That's why Jesus says, if you hold on to your life, you lose it. The only way to experience life is to release our life into the hands of God. He said, if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. So when we give God what is his, then we, re we experience resurrection life. Egypt doesn't do that. And now God steps in as a judge. Now, how does Israel remain safe from God's judgment? It's right here. L listen very carefully. Now, the blood. Johan, I want to hear him. I want you to say that, church. Say the blood. Say it again, the blood. the blood. Say it again, the blood. Okay. What is God's remedy? Let me hear it. Okay. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, say the blood again. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And oftentimes when we take communion, we focus on the bread alone for healing. But in a, I'll just touch on this very briefly now. I'm not going to keep you long. We'll keep for about 10 more minutes. Then we're going to receive communion. But, but the plague is repelled. Sickness is also repelled by the blood. So when we celebrate the Eucharist, Holy Communion, there isn't just healing in the bread. There is healing in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So the Lord sees the blood and decides to pass over. Okay? So death, the judgment that belongs to all who sin. Remember, Egypt is the land of death. Egypt is the place where you die in your sins unless you believe that he is and come under the beautiful flow of the blood. It is then we are protected, then that we are protected from uh, death and the plague. Leviticus 17.11, would you go there? And by the way, many of you know that the... the the Israelites would have taken hyssop, which speaks of faith, and they would have marked their front door, speaking of the human heart. They would have marked the front door with the sign of the cross. Remember, they were instructed, put the blood on the two doorposts. Those are the side posts, the frames, and the lintel, which would be the top. And so imagine every single house in Israel. Can't you just see it? Or I should say in Goshen. They were living in Egypt, similar to us living in the world today, we are in but not of. Uh, it's why the in the tabernacle there was no floor. You, their feet were actually in the dirt. It reminded them, they, the priests, while they were in the tent, I am, I am on earth, but my vision is upward. I'm looking at the beauty of God, but my vision or my feet are on the ground. I'm a pilgrim, but it's not my home. The similar picture here with the Israelites in Goshen. They are in Egypt but experiencing a different reality. And that speaks of the church today. And upon every front door, just think, three million people, who knows how many homes? Maybe, I don't know, seven, 800,000 homes, who knows? I, I don't know. 
upon every door was the sign of the cross and blood. Oh, you can picture that. It's so powerful. Leviticus 17.11. For the life of the flesh, this is very important, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. This is so important. Why is blood so important to God? Because the life of a being is in the blood. So much so that in Genesis 9, verse 6, look there, everyone watching their homes, I hope you're enjoying this and taking notes. It's not coffee, guys. It's water. Jesse's watching. She'd kill me if I were drinking coffee while I was preaching. Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. So here we see the image of God or the image and the image of man connected to each other and the role of the blood. What? Why, why does God require death for a man prior to Calvary if he sheds another man's blood? Because of the life of the flesh being in it. The life of the being is in the blood. And God is the author of life. God is the Lord of life. He's the king of life. So much so, check this out, that God is so protective over his life, over, the, over life itself, over the life of a person being in the blood. He's so protective over it that if an animal kills somebody, the animal in the law is taken out. He's so into this that if somebody else's animal kills another animal, that animal had to be taken out. So we see something very beautiful here and very important when we talk about the blood of Jesus. We see that his life is connected and fills his holy blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that's why the Lord said, you cannot eat an animal with his lifeblood in it. Drain the blood. This is very, very beautiful, very important. Okay. So the blood is sacred. I want you to write that down. The blood is sacred. The blood of Jesus is sacred. The blood of Jesus is holy. The blood of Jesus is filled with the life of Jesus. And... If you look at Psalm 22, let's go there very quickly. I'm going to take a long time on this teaching. Are you guys enjoying this? Can I just hear from you? Okay. All right. Now, Psalm 22. Verse 14. Now, this is Jesus on the cross, Psalm 22. He is speaking from the actual experience of the passion. Imagine Psalm 22, you are, are literally experiencing, uh, and I should say, uh, you have a front row seat to the experience of Christ Jesus on the cross. If you ever wonder, what was he thinking on the cross? Well, you can read it in Psalm 22. You can read it in Psalm 69. You can read it in Isaiah 50, Isaiah 53. It's all over the Bible, actually. But in Psalm 24, we see something here. I am poured out like water. I am poured out like water. And then in verse 20, we see, deliver me from the sword, my precious life 
from the, from the power of the dog, the dog speaking of the Roman Gentiles here. One translation in verse 14 would say, I poured my life out. Now, what did he pour out? Did water come out of his side? Of course, but what was flowing from his whole being? The blood. And so we see the connection between the blood and the life. Now, this will change your perspective because in about five minutes, I'm going to pray. And then the team will stand up. And you're going to come up and receive Holy Communion. When you understand that to receive Holy Communion is to receive the very life of the Holy Spirit, the life-giving power of the Spirit, you'll never receive the communion the same. You'll never pray over your children the same when you apply the blood of Jesus. I want you to always remember that the life, the life is in the blood. All right, let me give you just a few points before we close. Say this, the blood speaks. Come on, say it with fire. The blood speaks. I need to hear him, Yohan. The blood speaks. Okay, Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. That's what you're doing today through worship by the Spirit, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Here we go. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. That speaks better things than that of Abel. When we gather, we come into the very presence of God. We, by the Spirit, join heaven's worship service, and we come under the lordship of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who has sprinkled his blood on heaven's tabernacle, and that blood speaks better things than Abel. Say the blood speaks. Okay, what, does, what did Abel's blood speak? It spoke judgment. When Cain killed Abel, what did God say? What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out from the ground. The blood spoke regarding Cain. Mark him. Put a mark on him. Cast him out. Okay? God's how God dealt with Cain. But the blood of Jesus speaks better things, or a better word, than that of Abel. What does the blood of Jesus speak today? And this is where I'm going to close. It's in Revelation 5, verses 8 through 10. Revelation 5, verses 8 through 10. Now when he, Jesus, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell face down before the lamb. This is blood talk because lambs come to die. Each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are, by the way, the prayers of the saints. You know, your prayers never die. They go up like incense before the Lord. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. In other words, you poured out your blood. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Say thank you, Jesus. All right. What does the, what does the blood speak here? Number one, that we are purchased. That's the word redeemed. We are purchased. And that is Colossians 1.14. Write that down. You guys are getting a nice steak and eggs this morning. Colossians 
Colossians 1, verse 14. Let me read that to you. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Okay? In whom we have redemption. He has redeemed us. He has purchased us. Say, I am purchased by the blood of Jesus. Okay, number two. Number two. We have been forgiven by the blood. It's at the end of verse 14. Look at it right there. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus. You are as forgiven as you will ever be. The Lord Jesus has forgiven us by the blood. Every blot, every stain, every shortcoming is forgiven. Okay, according to Revelation 5, look down. He has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us kings. We have become a kingdom by the blood. The blood has, has taken the fallen sinner and introduced him to a kingdom and used their life to build a kingdom, the very kingdom of God that is filled with the present of the Holy Spirit. Why the word kingdom there? It's because we are not slaves to sin. We reign in life over sin through yielding to Jesus. All by the blood. Say thank you, Lord. The blood teaches that we're covered. That's Exodus 12, 13 again. I won't, I won't go there. We already talked about it. The blood was smeared over the house and the plague could not come near, neither did judgment. So we're covered by the blood. Okay, next. We are protected by the blood. This is so powerful. I want you to quickly turn to Job. Job uh, 1, verse 10. Remember, Satan, uh, actually we'll start in verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord. He's standing before the Lord here and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Listen to what he says about, about Job. This is Satan talking. Have you, the Lord, not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? What hedges is he talking about? What did Job do prior to that? Offer sacrifices? Job had a revelation of the blood. And how did Satan see the application of the blood? In the blood over your life and your children and everything you do and touch, your businesses, your churches, your ministries, start applying the blood of Jesus by faith. You say, why do I have to speak it? They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Testimony is always connected to the blood. It must be released verbally. Okay, that's what that word means, testimony. What is the testimony of? The blood. So remind yourself, remind your family in prayer of the accomplishment of the blood. So we're protected. That's Job 1.10. Next, we're washed. We're washed. That's Matthew 26, verse 28. As the Lord is instituting the Last Supper, he says... Uh, this is my blood, which is shed for you. This is Matthew 26, 28, for the remission, the washing away, the removal of sin. And I think we'll stop there. All right, let's stand to our feet, please. Thank you, Lord. Come on, just lift your hands and just right where you are, just begin thanking the Lord for the blood. Do you realize that the unbeliever is a child of darkness, a slave to sin? It's just what the Bible says. A son of the enemy, a partaker of death, separated from God. Do you realize that the blood has purchased us, redeemed us? You need to be thanking the Lord right now. Washed us, cleansed us, protected us, and brought us near into the holiest place. This is what the blood has done for us. And so, Father, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the journey you're going to take us on as a church family into the power 
power and beauty of the blood of Jesus. There is no one like you. Give all the glory. It's impossible to teach on the blood and not worship you, Lord. It's impossible. And so even now in Jesus' name, begin to release the power of the Holy Spirit to bring healing, to deliver them from pain and sickness and bondage. Deliver your people. I plead the blood over everyone watching, over everybody under the sound of my voice. I plead the blood of Jesus over all of you in Jesus' name. Be healed. And I do pray, Father, that as they come forward, or even now as they take communion, that your healing power would flow, and that every, every sickness would die in the life of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Can I hear him, guys? Thank you, Jesus. Now we're going to receive communion. Don't go anywhere. But before, before uh, I leave, tonight is going to be uh, somebody very, very, very special is going to be ministering uh, to us tonight. Uh, you, you want to be there. I'm believing God for incredible healings, incredible miracles. I'm believing the Lord for his word to be released with, with power and clarity. And I believe it'll be a, a, a night that is going to change the destinies of many of you. So get to here early, come hungry, get ready to worship the Lord. I'd like the worship team to come forward. Um, the entire team, please, uh, as the people are receiving communion. And uh, Carla, you and the ushers, if you could get ready uh, so that the people will, will be able to receive properly. And as the people are coming forward, worship team, just lead them in some old songs about the blood of Jesus. You're welcome to take the elements. You can go back to your seat, receive them with your families. If you're alone, receive them with somebody else. Uh, if, if, if you're not alone and you see somebody who is, invite them to be with you. And then once you've received and, and experienced the Lord, you're welcome to go. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you tonight. God bless you all. I love you so much.
Jesus Image in Orlando, Florida. We are so excited to be coming to the West Coast of America, specifically California, and we really believe this is the Lord and that He is about to move in great power and glory in America. And it's an honor for us to be part of that storyline. That being said, we want to broadcast these incredible meetings to the world. As you know, the Lord has really blessed uh, the media ministry here at Jesus Image. We have an amazing team, but at the end of the day, we all know and are aware of the fact that it is the Holy Spirit. We need a separate system to broadcast the Jesus Tour and our other events on the road. The cost of that is $350,000. And so I'm asking all of you to pray and to deeply consider being a part of helping us see the nations tune in to the move of the Holy Spirit on the West Coast. So would you pray about sowing a seed and walking in generosity? I know the Lord will bless you for it as we give back to Him what He's already given us for the sake and glory of His name.